Let's talk about upper GI bleeds. And this refers to any bleeding that comes from the GI tract that is proximal to the ligament of trites. So we're talking about anything that comes from the esophagus, stomach, or duodenum, or duodenum. I never knew how to say that. But the ligament of trites is a dividing line between the duodenum and the jejunum. And what's so special about the ligament of trites? Why is that the dividing line? Well, proximal to it is the foregut, and distal to it is the midgut. The blood supply is also different, with the uh, proximal portion getting it from the, their blood from the celiac artery and, uh, artery, and the midgut area getting it from the superior mesenteric artery. But I suspect the real reason we make the distinction is that this is what is uh, reachable by endoscopy. After all, we do call it the EGD, the, you know, gastric, esophageal gastric duodenum. So when we classify it, first thing we got to make is the distinction of whether this is an, a real or a cause coming outside of the GI tract. Because a GI bleed will usually present as the vomiting of blood, and it doesn't have to be coming from the GI tract. It could be swallowed blood from, say, epistaxis or trauma. And so true upper GI bleeds we break down into variceal and non variceal And most of the non variceal uh, bleeds are going to be pep due to peptic ulcer disease. So variceal bleeding tends to start with cirrhosis, which leads to portal hypertension and then dilated uh, submucosal veins, usually in the lower third of the esophagus or the, the, the distal five centimeters is where most of them occur. And it's associated with a pretty high mortality. Mallory Weiss tears occur usually around the GE junction, and they are longitudinal tears in the mucosa uh, that typically happen after severe episodes of retching and vomiting. Most of these don't need any other therapy other than to stop the vomiting because they're going to resolve on their own. Another rare cause of upper GI bleeding, but an important one to diagnose, is uh, are cancers. So when you're patients with HIV, make sure you think about Kaposi's. And, of course, you can get vascular malformations called angiodysplasia in the gut. You can really get it anywhere, and they tend to occur in many places. And these are also a source of upper GI bleeding that often recur either endoscopy, angiography, embolization, or medica medications, or even surgery to, to fix. And finally, let's look at peptic ulcer disease. And so we're going to take a microscopic view here at the cells in the gastric mucosa. And here we have an electron microscope picture of the uh, one of the gastric pits. And there's a whole bunch of different kind of cells here. you got your epithelial cells, the mucus cells, which secrete mucus, the zymogenic cells that secrete uh, pepsinogens, parietal cells that re uh, release hydrochloric acid as well as intrinsic factor, and finally, the enterochromaffin-like cells that secrete histamine and gastrin, both of which uh, stimulate acid secretion as well. So H. pylori, we know, is a precipitant of uh, peptic ulcer disease. It's a helical gram-negative rod that burrows its way through, uh, to, through the epithelium to the underlying layer. And uh, as it does so, it allows the hydrochloric acid to get underneath, and that uh, promotes ulcer formation. Medications like NSAIDs get into the mucus cells, where they inhibit prostaglandin formation, which is necessary for forming mucus, and therefore uh, gets rid of that protected mucus barrier, making the stomach more susceptible to ulcer formation. And of course, we also know that steroids and cigarettes don't help. So how, do, how does upper GI bleeds present? Well, you can have blood coming out the top or out the bottom. Blood can either be frank blood coming out as hematemesis or partially digested as coffee grounds. And if it comes out the bottom, if it's partially digested, it's melana or blood mixed in with the stool as hematochesia. So, as we talked about the pathophysiology, the important things you want to look for on your history is age greater than 60. That tends to put a person at a worse prognosis for cancer, or they tend to have worse peptic ulcer disease, NSAID use, history of H. pylori, or liver disease. On your physical exam, you might see the stigmata of liver disease, such as jaundice, polymer erythema, spider angiomas, gynecomastia, uh, 
an acidic belly, they have ascites. So let's talk now about how do we manage these patients. And the first thing that we always start with is our primary survey, A, B, C. So these guys are bleeding, and they're bleeding out of their mouths. And so their airway is in jeopardy for a couple of reasons. They could aspirate the blood, and they tend to be somewhat obtunded because they're bleeding. And so you may need to secure the airway early. So get your endotracheal tube and intubate the patient. Breathing can be a problem if they are hypoxic. And so you may need to supply supplemental oxygen. Uh, and if you're intubating the patient, you'll do that through the endotracheal tube. Now the other thing is they are losing blood. And what's blood's job? It's to carry oxygen around. So they do not have their transport system for oxygen. So whatever blood they have, let's make sure that it has plenty of oxygen in it to get around. So another reason to supply supplemental oxygen however you're getting it in, uh, probably through an endotracheal tube. And finally, circulation. And they tend to be hypotensive, so you're going to need an IV to provide them with some resuscitation. And not just one IV, but two IVs. And not just two IVs, but two large bore IVs. And I recommend putting one in each extremity. And the crystalloid that you're going to give, either normal saline or lactate or ringers, is just going to buy you time until you're going to get some O-negative blood. And then you're going to want to hang that instead because what's the patient losing? Blood, so let's give them blood. And depending on how much they're bleeding, they may need more than one unit. And then the next thing you're going to want to consider is putting in an NG tube, a nasogastric tube. And the reason for the NG tube is to see if we have a bleeding source that is continuing to bleed. If you're able to aspirate blood out the top of the tube, then you know that this is going to be quite an aggressive resuscitation. Now, if you don't aspirate blood, it still could be an upper GI bleed. You just may not be getting any blood out at this point. And at this point, I'd be getting two people on the phone, two people whose services we may need. GI, who may need to do endoscopy, and surgery, if the bleeding is so bad that it makes endoscopy uh, not possible. So for the, for the bleeds that are not so terrible, I might not call surgery right away, but I would call GI. But the ones that are bad, I'm calling both. There are also a couple of medications you can think about giving. Uh, and the first one is a PPI. And so proton pump inhibitors inhibit the proton pump, obviously, and they've been shown to uh, take away the inhibition that the low pH causes on platelet aggregation. So you're going to have more clot formation, you're going to decrease the chance of rebleeding, and therefore decrease the length of stay. They probably don't have any change on mortality, but you still give it because we want to stop the rebleeding. Vasopressin uh, is a vasoconstrictor that'll decrease blood flow to the gastric mucosa. It unfortunately has also not been shown to decrease mortality, but does increase the probability of heart attacks and mesenteric ischemia, so it does have some bad side effects. Octreotide, on the other hand, slows down circulation without uh, those other side effects, so maybe a safer choice. Okay, so now let's talk about some other therapies that we got. And the next one, we, the reason we call GI is endoscopy. And if you can see the bleeding source with endoscopy, you have a couple options. You can do banding, epi injection, and sclerotherapy. For variceal bleeding, you can try balloon tamponade. You insert a special catheter down into the esophagus near the varices, and then you inflate a balloon right on top of them, hopefully tamponading them. Now, the problem with this is that it could cause perforation or even aspiration. So it's not without some serious complications. Another option is if you can find the bleed is angiography so that they can put in a catheter and uh, embolize the wound, the bleeding vessel, and hopefully stop the bleeding that way. And then, of course, surgery is another option for bleeds that you just can't control uh, using any of these other techniques. And these tend to be the really bad cases, so that's why I will often call surgery in the bleeds that are really bad, even though I haven't tried anything yet, because I'd rather have them on board early, because we don't have a lot of time when they're bleeding out, and then uh, they can get to the OR faster. All right, that was our short trip through upper GI bleeds. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.